All right, John chapter 5, please, and we'll look at verse 35. John chapter 5 and verse 35. We're only going to focus on this verse, and then I will break it down and preach to you a textual yeah, message. Yeah. This passage is about John the Baptist. Jesus Christ describes John the Baptist as a burning and a shining light. Even though he is not the genuine light, he bore witness of the light. And that light is Jesus Christ. Jesus told those Jews who went through 400 years of silence, who are hard-hearted and who eventually crucified him, that John the Baptist was actually a burning and shining light to them, that they were able to have a moment, a moment of time where they were able to repent, a moment of time for revival, a moment of time to change their ways because of John the Baptist, because he was a burning and a shining light. In John chapter 5 and verse 35, he was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. John the Baptist was a burning and a shining light. <coughs> Those Jews were willing for a moment of time to be able to rejoice, to be able to be happy, to be able to be stirred up in their hearts, to be on fire for God because of a burning and a shining light named John the Baptist. Brother and sister in Christ, we got a burning and a shining light. We got the preaching of the Word of God, and that stirs up your heart. That's why you come over here. We just had a blowout, and that stirred up our hearts. That was truly a burning and a shining light. And it kept us going and made us want to fight against sin. It made us want to sing. It made us want to shout. It made us want to do something for God. It stirred up our hearts because of a burning and a shining light from the preaching of the Word of God, because of a blowout, because of a revival meeting. But it is also so true that it only lasts for a moment. That it is not a permanent thing. And we love our blowouts. <laughs> we love the preaching of the Word of God. But we do get sick and tired of losing the fire. I don't know about you, but I get sick and tired of shouting the victory and the very next day that I get depressed. I get sick and tired of being fired up for God, but then the next day I backslide. I get sick and tired what I, where I praise His name and I have the joy of the Lord in a revival meeting, but then the next day I feel guilty. I feel isolated and I feel so wicked and my flesh gets me down. I'm getting sick and tired of that and I don't want my flame to kindle for just a little moment. I want my fire burning for all eternity. Man, if hell is forever, why can't the fire in my spirit last forever? Is not the Holy Spirit likened to a flame of fire? And isn't the Holy Spirit eternal? Then why not? Why can't my lamp keep on burning for all eternity? I want my fire to, to burn bright and to kindle like a flame and not to just last for a moment. I rejoice only in that day when John the Baptist shines out like a burning light, I'm only going to rejoice in that day. I want to rejoice all the days of my life. I want to rejoice and please God and feel like that I am in fire mode till Jesus comes again. That's what I want. I think that's why those seraphims and those cherubims, they can keep praising God. They can keep surrounding God. You know why? Because they're likened to angels of fire. They have tongues of fire. They're surrounded by fire. I think that's why they don't lose their shout. I want a fire like that that keeps on burning. So true. So true from the text. He was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing. You were willing to get right with God. You were willing to clean up your sin. 
You're willing to shout. You're willing to run. And you're willing to sow. And you're willing to get a revival. You're willing to serve God for a season to rejoice in His light. What can make us keep on going? That's the question, right? That's what we want to know. I know you and I have that in you, but we just don't. We just don't do it. So we'd like to know, how can I keep this fire going, Pastor? I want to. I have it in me, but I just can't, and I just don't know how. I would like to show you a few things that could be eye-opening to you and might explain why you lose your fire so quickly and how you can keep your fire going. You remember that blowout experience? Do you remember the preaching of the Word of God that stirred your heart? Come on, you can't tell me that you didn't enjoy that. Come on, you can't tell me that you don't want that. I know that deep inside your heart there's something in there that enjoyed it, that loved it, that couldn't help but find it irresistible. And don't you want to keep that going? Then open your ears and I pray that your hearts will be able to see something from the Word of God where you can keep the blowout going. Will you pray with me? Now, Father... I pray you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood to preach because I cannot preach. I really can't, Father. And I pray that this sermon will speak and reach the hearts of the listeners. And you will get the glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's focus on the first part of the verse. I believe in this verse... Certain words and phrases will give the answer. I believe this verse is key that has several parts in it that if you were to pay attention, that if you were to learn and apply, then you can keep the fire going, not just for a moment, but for a lifetime. Let's establish that. Let's examine this verse and find out what those parts are. Wonder what it could be. Well, the first part is, he was a burning and a shining light. Jesus Christ said that John the Baptist is not a burning and a shining light. He said that he was in the past tense. If you and I were to look at this verse, we might think that it's because John the Baptist is already dead. Now, you and I know that John the Baptist, he was preaching the word of God. Later on, he got imprisoned by Herod. And as Jesus continued on his ministry, John the Baptist eventually died. So when Jesus Christ was preaching in his ministry, John the Baptist should have died. He was a burning light. Maybe that's what it would mean, right, if you and I looked at that verse. And I'll be honest, I think that's the right interpretation. I think that because John the Baptist died, that's why he's no longer a burning and a shining light, but that he was. However, I would like to be open to another theory. I actually don't believe in this theory, but I am open to this theory. I cling more to the option that John the Baptist died. That's why he was a burning and a shining light. But from what I noticed in other chapters in the Bible, they seem to indicate another reason why he was a burning and a shining light. Why it should be past tense. And I'm open to the theory, and because it makes good preaching, I'm going to tell you, even if I don't believe it. But I believe in the preaching of it, and I believe in the openness and the possibility of it. And I'll tell you one thing, if there's any possibility from the Word of God, 
I think I should have my ears open because maybe the Lord might show me some blessing or some truth behind it. Amen? All right, so let's see why he was a burning and a shining light. Go to John chapter 3. <clears throat> John chapter 3. Notice it mentions about <coughs> John the Baptist again. And when John the Baptist is pointed out in the same book of John. And the author is the same here. We looked at John 5, correct? I mean, just two chapters behind is John 3. So we can take it for granted that the author, he has this same mindset. The same context is ongoing. Notice what the author says when he brings up John the Baptist. He says at John chapter 3 and verse 23, And John also was baptizing in Anon near, Sa near to Salem, <coughs> because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Okay, the author mentioned right here as if it was important to know, hey, when I bring up John... It's important to understand that John was not in prison yet. The author took it for granted that you, the reader, would assume that when John is mentioned, that uh, John could not be present at that time in John 3 because he was in prison. He should be in prison that time. That's why the author wrote down, no, 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 I just want you to understand the reason why I'm bringing up John right here is that he's not in prison yet. So the author always had it in mind that the audience, when they read about John the Baptist, that they would assume that when is he going to prison? He should be in prison by this time. John the Baptist, shouldn't he be in prison by now? They're not thinking about his death, see? The audience is not thinking about that John the Baptist is gone and he died. More so, the author is thinking that the audience would have it in mind that John the Baptist was in prison more than that he died. Do we understand so far? Okay, so that's what the author had it in mind when he was writing John chapter 3. What do you think? If the author had that in mind when he wrote John chapter 5, he was a burning and a shining light. What if he had that in mind that you and I, when we read that verse, we would be thinking John the Baptist is in prison by now, isn't he? Hence, that's why I think that in John chapter 5, when the author wrote down, he was a burning and a shining light, he took it for granted that you, the reader, that you, the audience, when we read that phrase, we would be thinking in our minds that John the Baptist is in prison by now. That's why he was a burning and a shining light. Brother and sister in Christ, you and I know when John the Baptist was in prison, his light was flickering. You and I know that his light wasn't really shining bright. He was away from the attention. He is no longer in the scene because his ministry ends right there in the prison cell. His ministry is no longer going out while he's stuck in Herod's jail cell. Who was the attention now? Who was the focus while John the Baptist was in prison? I think John the Baptist told you. He knew what it was. Look at verse 30. John the Baptist said, He, that's Jesus Christ, must increase, but I, John the Baptist, must what? John the Baptist knew that his light would decrease and the light of Jesus Christ would increase. He knew that his ministry would lessen more and more and disappear from the scenery, and Jesus Christ's ministry would be the one to take over. That's why when he was in prison, 
That's when the focus and the attention was now on Jesus' ministry, not on John the Baptist's ministry. I want you to look at John chapter 12 now. John chapter 12. Okay, what are you trying to drive at in the preaching here? What does this have to do with me being fired up? We're getting there, but I want you to go scripture with scripture patiently with me. I want you to keep everything that I said in mind. That way you can see the good preaching behind it that you can learn from. So John the Baptist's light was, right? Past tense. No longer the focus and the attention. Why? Because he was in prison and Jesus Christ became the replacement. Jesus Christ should be increased. John the Baptist should be taken out of the way. Correct? John the Baptist, his light and his ministry is temporary. Correct? Yes. Because he ended up in prison. He was a burning and a shining light. But the light of Jesus Christ, he is, right? He is, I am that I am. His light is eternal. Yes? Amen. Shouldn't that be a better light that we should follow then? Not John the Baptist? John the Baptist's light is temporary, friend. He's only a past tense. But Jesus Christ, he is ever-present. He is eternal. And that's the light you want if you want to keep on burning. Not John the Baptist. You know why? Because John the Baptist can have a prison moment, an imprisonment. And that will take away the light. And that light is only temporary. The light that you need is Jesus Christ. Well then, pastor, I know that Jesus is the light. You and I can agree with that, amen? He is the eternal light, amen? How can I have that light where I can keep on burning onward and onward forever and ever? Not the light of John the Baptist where it's temporary and it fades out. How can I have the light of Jesus Christ that's eternal, that's fixed, that can keep me burning forever? The Bible shows you, if you have the light, then this is what you need to do. John chapter 12, verse 35, verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Jesus Christ is the light, correct? And you have him with you, correct? Walk while you have the light. Do you have the light? Amen. You and I should have the light. If you are saved in Jesus Christ, you have the light of the world in you. Amen. You have Jesus Christ in you. Then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to walk in it. Look at verse 36. 36. While ye have light. Okay, I'm going to ask you again. Do you have the light? Yes, you and I have the light in us, Jesus Christ. Then what should you do? Believe in the light. If you want the light of Jesus Christ to keep on burning in your heart and in your soul where you can stay fired up and press on for God, let me tell you something, brother and sister in Christ, you already have it. But what you need to do with it is you need to believe in that light and you need to walk in that light. Now let me give you an example that way you can better understand. I am a Baptist preacher, amen? Do you all agree with that? Thank God that I am. I'm an independent Baptist and I will die an independent Baptist. I'm proud to be a Baptist. And this Baptist preacher can preach fire into you. And when he preaches the word of God, you get fired up, you get pumped up. And the blowout is a great example of so many Baptist preachers preaching fire in your heart and in your soul, and then you get so pumped up that you can't help it but just go out and do something for God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. But when that Baptist preaches you the Word of God, that is an example of the light of John the Baptist. That's the light of John the Baptist. All the John the Baptists you've heard, and they preached light and fire into you. But guess what? 
They was, if that's good English, <laughs> was a burning and a shining light. It's only temporary. It's only temporary, friend, when these Baptist preachers get up to you and give you the word of God. It's only temporary and it's a past tense. We can't bring back the blowout. We can't. We can't bring back all these preachers here again. We don't have that today. You don't see them here. We don't have page 67 with everybody, you know, singing and shouting. We don't have all the great specials. We don't have the lineup. Was, all of that was a burning and a shining light. And that's the light of John the Baptist. It's temporary. It's a past tense. But guess what? You sitting under this preaching, hearing a Baptist preacher is an example of the light of John the Baptist. The fire you're feeling right now, you know what that is? The light from John the Baptist. You know what the light of Jesus Christ is? Not sitting and hearing the preaching of the Word of God. When you go out and you believe in the light of Jesus Christ, that can fire you up. Amen. When you believe from the preaching of the Word of God, when you believe from what you read in that book, when you believe in His promises, when you believe in that fire that pumps you up in the light of Jesus Christ and you actually walk in it. That is the light of Jesus Christ that never dies out. When you're hearing this preaching, that light dies out. But when you believe and you walk in that, that's forever. That's a lifetime. You know what walk means? I looked it up at Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Walk means to actually do it. To actually live it. You know what's, you know what's going to pump you up? more than all the Baptist preachers combined with, that will give you a spectacular blowout blow that will fire you up? You know what's more powerful than that? You know what will fire you up more? If you believe in that and you actually do them. That will fire you up more Amen. than sitting under all the Baptist preachers combined. You might say, well, I don't believe in it. I don't know about it. See, you just didn't believe in it. That's why you lost your fire. The verse says you're supposed to believe in it. Well, you know, I don't know if doing all those things will get me pumped up. Well, you, you ever had it in your flesh where you were just depressed and you didn't feel like singing and you didn't feel like going out soul winning, you didn't feel like going to church, but if you just did it, then you eventually got fired up? You know, you know what you need to do? You need to just do it. You need to just have faith. Well, you know, I got to think about this. Well, I'm not sure. I really wonder if that will really work. Hey, hey, just shut that off. Just believe in it and just do it, man. Well, I don't know if soul winning will get me fired up. Just do it, man. Just go out on the college campus and street preach. Just do it. Just pass out the tracks. And trust me, after that, you'll be all fired up and you will feel happy and you will rejoice in the light of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know if... Uh, Staying away from that sin, if I can do it, or if that's good for me, or if I'll be really happy if I stay away from the world, or uh, if that's sin, I really wonder if it'll make me depressed, if it'll make me sad, and no, just do it, man, just don't do the sin, and you can end your day more happy, Amen. more energetic, more fired up for God. That will do you more fired up good than just sitting down and hearing the Baptist preacher. You feel that fire right now? Do you feel the fire of the Baptist preacher putting a light in you? Well, guess what? We'll fire you up more. If you go out and do it and you believe it, then everyone will come charging in all fired up and then the singing will get better. Sitting under the preaching will get better. Getting involved in the church will get better. Just believe it and do it. 
That's a fire. That's the light that will never go out. But every preacher and every blowout and every John the Baptist that comes up to you, their light will always be a was. They will always be in the past. You need the light of Jesus Christ. That is, God is, I am that I am, and that is eternal. You just need to believe in it and you need to do it. See, it's always your doubt. It's always your flesh not doing it. That's why you're not fired up. Now look at uh, John 5 again. He was a burning and a shining light. And that verse says, and ye were willing. Ye were willing. These Jews, they were willing to get rid of their sins. They were willing to serve God. They were willing to do anything for the Lord because of that light of John the Baptist. You know why I think they were willing? Later on you read that those Jews were hard-hearted. They had a flesh problem. So what made them willing under the ministry of John the Baptist? Don't you feel like that? Don't you want to know what would make you willing to stay away from sin? What would make you willing to serve God? What would make you willing to keep the fire going? You and I want that, don't you? Amen. You know what will make you willing? Go to Exodus 35. Exodus 35. Only this thing can make you willing. And everyone has this. Every saved believer has this. This is the thing that will make, make you willing. Evangelist O'Shea preached about it. You know what the Bible says? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know what that verse points out? The flesh is weak. Flesh gets to us. That's why we lose the fire. But what can combat that? What can go against the feelings of your flesh? See, that's why we don't get fired up for God, because how we feel right now today. We, our flesh just went through some trial, some storm. Some storm or we just don't feel good. We just feel bad. A lot of people got sick after the blowout. I mean, how can anyone stay fired up for God after that? The only thing that will override the feelings of the flesh is the willingness from the Spirit. Exodus 35 your answer is here. The Bible points out in verse 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up. That sounds like getting fired up, right? Getting stirred, motivated, inspired. Well, what made them stirred up? And everyone, what? Whom his spirit made. Made, made, made willing. Evangelist Soche preached to you a very powerful message. To not blame your flesh. It's your fault. The flesh cannot do anything without your permission. And what did he mention? It's because it's from your spirit. He mentioned that he's scared to skip Bible reading and prayer. Do you know why? Because without Bible reading and prayer, he can't clean his spirit. And without his spirit clean, that spirit will not have the strength or the sustenance to keep making him willing against the feelings of his flesh. You know why the flesh gets a hold of you? You know why you can't get victory over some sins? You know why you can't rejoice in the Lord no matter how heavy your flesh feels? Because your feelings from the flesh override your willpower. From the Spirit. Come on, brother, that's good. Come on. You know how you get that willpower from? From that Spirit. You need to feed that Spirit. That Spirit needs to be empowered so that your willingness can override, can overpower your fleshly feelings. Now, I want you to go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. 
That's a lot of scriptures you're turning today, Pastor. Yeah, you'll need them. You'll need a lot of scriptures. That way you can see the answer to how to stay fired up. Look at Luke chapter 1. You know why the people listened to John the Baptist? You know why they casted off their sins? Their flesh didn't feel offended. Their flesh didn't get the best of them. And they just were willing to listen to John the Baptist preaching and change their lives because of Luke chapter 1. And notice what God says at verse 15, verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. That's John the Baptist the angel is talking about. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be what? Filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he what? Turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts. See that? Of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Brother and sister in Christ, John the Baptist was able to fire up the people get them to repent of their sins, get them to live for God because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And when those Jews encountered the spiritual presence, that spiritual presence was so strong and so thick that it could overwhelm the feelings of the flesh and they couldn't help but repent and get right with God. Do you have a spiritual presence like that? So thick and so big that it will overwhelm the feelings of the flesh? Do you have that? Do you know what spirit means? Spirit means mood, atmosphere, presence. A lot of it does relate to feelings too. You didn't know that. I would like to ask you a question. After church, and, after church is over, what's the spirit in your house? Without the preaching of the word of God when Sunday is over, what spirit fills within every day in your mind? What spirit do you feel as you undergo trials or temptation? Is it a heavy spirit? Is it a depressed spirit? Is it all the world around you? I'll tell you a pervasive spirit that contributes to a lot of sin, to a lot of weak service for the Lord. A comforting spirit, a spirit of comfortableness, easy access, convenience. That's the spirit within our world. When you're surrounded and immersed in that, your flesh can't even pull up a single effort for God. Because all the flesh is feeling and experiencing is a spirit of convenience. Well, it's so hard to come to church. How do I get into church? If I watch a bunch of blowout videos and rewatch them, and they put a spirit of motivation, a spirit of preaching and inspiration in me, I can't wait to come back to Sunday church. But if I have no spirit like that, how can I drive an hour or more than an hour through this crazy Bay Area traffic into church. How can I get into this church if I'm filled with the spirit of convenience? Making me feel good and what's easy, what I'm so used to. How can I even drive to this church then? I can't give victory over my sin and the temptation. The flesh is just so weak and... Oh, what, are you, what is your spirit filled with? 
I'll tell you one thing. You can't sin now. You know why? You're surrounded by a spirit of accountability, of being with the brethren, and a spirit of serious preaching from the Word of God. That's what you're surrounded by, that spirit. But I'll tell you what, if you're surrounded by a spirit of isolation, a spirit of, this is my time, not my time for God, a spirit of convenience, you'll easily sin. Spirit can only make you do spiritual things, keep you in the spiritual right path. Spirit feeds spirit. If you want to read the Bible, but you have a struggle reading the Bible, then fill yourself up with the spirit of prayer. Or fill yourself up with the with Bible being read to you from the audio if you're just so lazy. And have that spirit reach into you that will motivate you to finally open the book and read it. Fill yourself with the spirit of encouragement of brothers and sisters in Christ telling you about soul winning if you're afraid to go out soul winning. If you struggle with soul winning. Immerse yourself with the spirit of encouragement and inspiration from other brethren who go out soul winning. See, spirit feeds spirit. And if you want to turn your heart away from sin and turn your heart toward God, and if you want to be fired up and have something that John the Baptist was able to turn the hearts of the children to the Father, the reason why those Jews who were hard-hearted after 400 long years of silence, they were able to be fired up and seek after God and repent of their sins is because they were surrounded and immersed by the Holy Spirit in John the Baptist. And even if he ate locust and wild honey and wore camel's hair and looked crazy and weird, they didn't care because the Holy Spirit presence was that thick, buddy, that those people repented their sins and cleaned up their lives. I don't care how many locusts and camel's hair and strange, weird hindrances happen in your life. You're going to repent. You're going to live for God. You're going to get fired up if you encounter a thick spiritual presence. Now, how often do you encounter a thick spiritual presence? Now we go to back to John 5 again. I hope this is helping you. This is actually very practical. This helps you stay fired up, stay in the light. Listen, you're not going to rejoice and shout for God if you're always filled with the spirit of depression and complaint and bitterness. If you change it to thanksgiving and if you change it to singing, that spirit makes you willing to stay rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, no matter how bad life is. What spirit are you using? The Bible says in John chapter 5 and verse 35, the, la uh, the next part says, you were willing for a season, for a season. It's only momentary that they got fired up from the light of John the Baptist. I think some of you can think about another verse that says for a season. Can some of you think about that verse? There is pleasure in sin for a season, right? Pleasure in sin for a season. Well, then if you and I get fired up from the light of John the Baptist, and because that Baptist preacher was just that good, man. I don't care if that Baptist preacher was 87. That was just good preaching. I couldn't help but get fired up and get on the altar, get right with God. I don't care what nationality or ethnicity that pastor was or if I couldn't understand half of what he said because of from a certain state that he's from. That was real good preaching. That Baptist preacher was just that good and then the altar was just filling up all the aisles in the front. There was no space anywhere. It was just that good. That was really, really good stuff. But it only lasts for a season, right? The, o the other thing that lasts for a season too is sin. Pleasure and sin. 
Well, if both of them last for a season, then my question is, why do we sin in pleasure more often than getting fired up for God? I mean, both of them have the same time span. Both of them are temporary. So shouldn't it be just 50-50? 50% 50, 50 I'm doing well for God, fired up. 50% I'm uh, living in pleasure for a season. Wouldn't that make more sense? But why is it our human nature has the tendency to sin more often than getting fired up for God? You know what the difference is? We know that the pleasure in sin is temporary, but it's just that good that we chase after it again. Well, doesn't sin bring depression? Doesn't sin bring guilt? Doesn't sin cost? Sometimes, listen, sometimes it is hard to sin. If you want to do a specific sin, sometimes you have to break the law, you have to do something illegal, you have to sneak. You have to save up money. Sometimes you have to find the right connections. That ain't easy. Sometimes sin is hard to do. But why do we chase after it? Why do we do it? Because we believe it's worth that much. It's worth losing sleep over. That's why I'll sin. It's worth getting depressed afterwards. That's why I'll sin. It's worth feeling down and guilty because sin is just that pleasurable. It's worth it to face the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and God to frown at me and to not give me rewards. Sin is worth that much. That's why we chase after sin, even if it's temporary. Is getting fired up for God worth it that much to you, even if it's temporary? Well, you know, the blow was great, but it's only temporary. Yeah, but it's just that good, ain't it? So ain't it worth it to try to save up money and do that thing again? It's worth it and that much good. That's why it's worth losing sleep over to do it again, right? It's just that good. That's why it's worth getting sick over. Just to have that again, isn't it? A lot of people don't serve God anymore, don't come to church, don't get involved, because they don't think it's worth it that much to do it. Well, I got, uh, got to drive a long way. Well, you know, I got, uh, I'm just so busy. Well, it's just so hard to serve God. You can think a million excuses, but you don't think that way about sin. Sin has its problems too, not just serving God. You think serving God has its problem? Living in sin has its problems too. Depression, guilt, broken families, broken minds, broken hearts. Yet you could care less, buddy, because sin is worth it that much to you. And why can't you think the same for, about church, about serving God, about reading your Bible, about living for Him? Ain't it worth it that much to lose sleep over? Ain't it worth it that much to suffer over? Ain't it worth it that much to have a broken home over? Ain't it worth it that much to sometimes have a broken life over? Ain't it worth it that much to pay a hefty price over? Some martyrs thought so when they died and burnt at the stake. Amen. That's why some of you will drive more than an hour or more than three hours to get here. You think it's worth it that much. That's why some of you are willing to face criticism from your family and be looked down upon by the world. When you do soul winning because witnessing the cost of a soul is worth it that much precious. How much worth it is this to you? How much worth it is this to you? That's why you don't get fired up. Because the fire is not that much worth it to you. See, you, you can... You can shout and march around the aisles on page 67, but see, deep down inside your heart, that ain't worth it to you, that fire. See, you can get excited, get on the altar, repent, 
and because of the blowout, but I'm telling you something. I don't think that fire is worth it that much to you. I don't think this preaching means a hill of beans to you. I think some of you, this preaching has no worth. It ain't worth it that much to you. So you should have stayed back at home. Maybe you shouldn't attend church more often. Your, your business is that much more important. Your schoolwork is that much more important. Your family, your house life, your own comfort level is that much more important to you than the preaching of the Word of God. That's why you don't stay fired up because the fire is not that much worth it to you to pay a hefty price over. If you want this, you got to be willing to pay a hefty price. It's the same thing with sin, friend. Everything in life has a price to pay. Everything in life has a price to pay. John chapter 5, and then the last part of verse 35, it says, to rejoice in his light. To rejoice in his light. The people were able to rejoice, be fired up for God in the light of John the Baptist. Let's take a look at that light at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. You know what Jesus Christ says later on in John chapter 5? He says, you were willing to rejoice in his light, John the Baptist. But my light, Jesus says, is better than John the Baptist. Yet... You reject it. You don't want it. What? How can they reject the light of Jesus and prefer the light of John the Baptist? Does, that doesn't make sense. There's something about the light of Jesus that they didn't like compared to the light of John the Baptist. Let's look at this. Luke chapter 3. Look at verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. So John the Baptist is preaching. He's saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Repent. And he also had an altar call. So... His altar call was obviously water baptism. All of you know that water baptism has nothing to do with uh, saving you from sins. Water baptism is a public acknowledgement of what you're doing. When we get baptized in this church, it's not to get salvation. It's to publicly acknowledge, publicly show to people that I am already saved. That's what an altar call is too. It's a public showing to others that I am repenting, that I am getting right with God. That's, what, that's why they got baptized there. It's because they were confessing their sins and then water baptism actually was a public confession to everybody. Oh, so that guy is going down on the altar there, on that water, to show that he repented of his sins to show that he's getting right with God. Man, John the Baptist's church service was like any other church service. It was like a blowout revival meeting. And John the Baptist, he was saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And you hear that Baptist preacher saying, prepare, prepare. Get your heart right with God. Get rid of that sin. Serve him with the rest of your days. Preparation, preparation. The preacher is preparing your hearts. And people, they don't get offended. People, they rejoiced in his day. They were willing. But there was something about Jesus Christ that they couldn't do. As a matter of fact, if you look at uh, verse 11, verse 11, look at this, how they were rejoicing in his day. He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him <clears throat> that hath none, 
and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. You know what John the Baptist basically said? Hey, give away your coat, which is your clothing. Give away your meat, your food. Didn't you know that's basically all your necessities? Paul said, if I have food and raiment, therewith I am content. Well, you know what John the Baptist basically told them? Get rid of anything and everything that you can cling on to where you can stay content. These people basically gave up everything, that means. They gave up everything, and they were willing to do that. But, man, that's a hefty price to pay, isn't it? When you're giving up your necessities, that's a hefty price to pay. But see, those people, they thought that the fire, the light from John the Baptist was worth it that much, that they were willing to throw away their necessity. If Have you a fired up desire like that? Do you desire the fire of God that much where it will motivate and stir your heart that you're willing to throw away all your necessity, everything and anything, just to maintain that fire? These people did. They thought it was worth it. Our churches don't nowadays. And yet, isn't this amazing? They rejoiced in John the Baptist's day. When that's a, that's a lot to sacrifice. That's already requiring a lot. I mean, how could these people not get offended by John the Baptist? How can these people rejoice in John the Baptist's day? <laughs> rejoice in his light, but with the light of Jesus Christ, it's different. They can't do it. They reject it. What is so hard about it? You know what the light of Jesus Christ is? He said, just simply believe on me for salvation. Yet they rejected that. They hated that. This is unfathomable. What is the difference? Well, the light of Jesus Christ, it wasn't like John the Baptist. John the Baptist's light, see, was too easy where people can do it. To you and I, it's, it might seem hard, but to these people, that was something simple for them to do. Jesus knew exactly what to aim at the heart of the Jews where they wouldn't listen to him. And he said that too. He said, I know you guys. So I'm going to do this type of preaching so that you don't get converted. Not because Jesus was deliberately forcing them, because he was testing their hearts. You know what the Bible says the light of Jesus Christ does? The light reproves the darkness. Didn't you know reprove is from the same word as prove in Latin? You know what the light of Jesus Christ does? It tests. It aims at the center of your heart. That's what Jesus aims for in his light. You know what the light of John the Baptist does? Repent! Get on the altar! Get right with God! That's easy to do. What about when Jesus Christ gives a light and he says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have eternal life. Oh, he knew that would get the Jews mad. Jesus even clarified, hey, I'm not talking about literally like cannibalism. I'm talking about spiritually, just receiving me for salvation. <laughs> Here comes a disciple. Hey, Jesus, I will follow you. Lord, I I'm willing to follow you. I just heard John the Baptist preaching. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Here I am, Lord. I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. I don't know why you only have 12. You should get more, Jesus. I mean, I don't get it. You teach such deep doctrine. You draw on a whiteboard. Dispensational truth, King James only. I haven't heard anything like this. This has such authority. Why is it that you don't have more people in this church? Why don't you have more people becoming Bible believers? I don't get it. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not lay to where his hath no place to lay his head. And then that disciple goes, I can't do that. Lord Jesus, I will follow you. I got pumped up, man. John the Baptist prepared the way for you. I even got baptized. I repented. I want to follow you. 
Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. But I, I'm talking about my family here. I got to at least go to the funeral and let the dead bury the dead. Follow me. If any man hate not his father, mother, brother, sister, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Lord, I'm willing to follow you. If any man take not his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20? The spirit of man is the candlestick of the Lord searching the inward parts of the belly. That's an approximate quote of it. You know what the light of Jesus Christ is? The light of Jesus Christ is not simply a John the Baptist telling you to repent and get on the altar and casting away your necessities, your food and clothing to serve Jesus Christ. No, that's too easy for you. You know what the light of Jesus Christ is? It aims at your heart. Because that thing in your heart, you refuse to surrender to God. Jesus knows your very weakness that prevents you from serving him. And he says, give that up to me. And you don't do that. Do you know how many people have come to this altar weeping, repenting, forsaking their sin, getting on the altar, making a public acknowledgement from John the Baptist preaching? But they have not yet done what Jesus specifically aimed for and want them to get right. Do you know how many Christians still have pride issues after getting on the altar? Do you know how many Christians still have issues with bitterness amongst brethren in spite of a good preaching and altar call? Do you know how many brethren still have a self-centered attitude in spite of an altar call, in spite of repenting in a blowout preaching? Do you know how many people refuse to sacrifice what is most precious to them, surrendering all to Jesus Christ, even with a hundred altar calls they've been down at? That's the light of Jesus Christ. Why do I have to do that, Pastor? Because, brother and sister in Christ, if you don't, your fire will go out. Because that's the thing that's dampening your fire. If you refuse to give up and surrender to Jesus Christ, what he's pointing out to you, then your fire will always die out. In spite of a hundred altar calls you've been down at. I like this verse. The Bible says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. An approximate quote. You know what that verse points out? Let your loins be girded about. That means the person is made ready to keep his lamp burning. See, I'll tell you why your fire goes out. You're not ready. You're not ready. But I got on the altar. I got right with God. I confessed my sin. That's the light of John the Baptist. You know what the light of Jesus Christ is? You get out of the service and you get ready. Loins girded about, prepared. You know what prepared means? The intention to do it for the Lord. What douses your fire? What douses your fire, brother and sister in Christ? Are you ready, prepared to face it? If you still say, I don't know, then you don't have the light of Jesus Christ burning within you. But if you want to keep the light burning, you get out of this place with the intention that I'll do it. John the Baptist, he told them, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Repent, confess, make a public confession. And do you know how many of those people heard the preaching of the word of God? 
prepare to do this for the Lord. Repent. And they repented. And they came on the altar and made a public confession. But when the light of Jesus Christ shone, they weren't prepared for that. They weren't ready for that. When I start out my day, if I struggle with Bible reading and prayer, if I struggle with a certain sin problem, if I struggle with pride, bitterness, lack of patience, if God reveals to me some things that I need to change, the light of Jesus Christ shows me some things I need to repent and change, my mind needs to be prepared. My heart needs to be prepared. And I surrender that to the Lord. And I say, Lord, if that scenario happens, I'll be ready to shut my stinking mouth, to make sure that my hands do the things that you want me to do, and I will do that work for the Lord. No matter what that hindrance is that can douse my fire, I will be ready for that hindrance. Can you say that? No. That's why when hindrances happen, you cave in and you give up because you weren't prepared for it. What is the light you're going to choose today? Pastor, I got under conviction. You told me to prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist is preaching, prepare the way of the Lord. I got under conviction. I'm going to make a public confession. Here I am. I'm getting baptized right here. I'm making a public confession that I repent and I'll confess my sins and get right with God. No, you only got the light of John the Baptist and it'll be a past tense. It'll be a temporary thing. You know what light you need? The light of Jesus Christ. That's eternal. And that light says, let your loins be girded about and your lamps burning. Are you willing to gird up your loins out of your seat the full intention to keep that fire burning, the full intention for anything out there that will hinder your fire, the full intention that the light of Jesus exposes that you need to surrender to him. Do you have the full intention girding up your loins out of your seat and surrender to the light of Jesus Christ and to bring that fire out? That's the altar call that you need to do. Or is it simply going to be conviction, repentance, and a public confession? Every head bow and every eye shut.